Good morning from Vietnam, Rob. Thanks a lot for spending your afternoon joining our Inside Sharing Show and share your stories on behalf of the listeners. I want to say thank you to you. Well, thank you for having me on the show. And I always believe you're as good as your last conversation, so I'm ready. I'm ready to make it work. Let's let's have this conversation. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Rob, the closest country that, that you've been to Southeast Asia is, uh, was Malaysia, and that's a couple of years ago, right? So uh, we try to make Vietnam on the list. You know, you have a new friend, new family, and the next time you ever travel here for business or for you know personal um, trip, you let us know. So we would love to bring you out for you know showing you uh, our country, our people, and the food is delicious. Okay. Good. Well, that sounds great. Although I haven't earned it yet. Let's see. Let's see if you feel that way when we're at the end of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll make sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> and Rob, in our culture, it's very honors for our audience if we can have you to have to do a little introduction about who you are and the work that you do. Would you do that for us? Sure. Well, I'm Rob Jollis. I'm a professional speaker. I'll be. Uh, I spent about a decade with Xerox Corporation, and that's the company that uh, basically taught me how to sell. I, I worked for New York Life. I was a life insurance agent. They taught me to love selling. Hmm. But but Xerox, when I worked for Xerox, and this is 30 years ago now, um, were considered in the United States the greatest training company hmm. in the country when it came to sales. Uh, and they backed it up. I worked at a training facility that slept 1,100 people. Uh, and uh, was on in acreage, 2,400 acres. It's the second largest facility in the world. And it was amazing and, uh, and just an incredible place to work at. I spent 10 years there, uh, some selling for Xerox, then a trainer for Xerox, then managing all the Xerox trainers. And for those entrepreneurs who are listening, it'll be 30 years in April. I took a step out that door and decided, let's see if I can do this on my own. I call myself a salesman, now let's see what I really have. And uh, I'm celebrating 30 years, I go all over the world. I was mentioning I have over 3 million miles in the air, uh, just running keynotes, workshops, uh, I write books, I have six books, five bestsellers, and three wonderful children, and a terrific wife, and a nice dog and cat. How's that? That's me. <laughs> Wow, amazing, amazing. The whole amazing journey, beautiful journey that you've been summarizing about a, a minute and 20 seconds. So let's, uh, let's examine that journey together today, all right? Okay. All right. Uh, so Rob, uh, let's travel time together because we believe that everything has the beginning, right? So um, yes. uh, when I was young, I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, you know, wearing an astronaut suit and jumping in a different planet, right? So uh, life did not give me anything close to what I wanted to, to do. So for you, having a phenomenal career in sales and travel the world, teaching people to, to do sales, I want to know the, the youngest person of Rob when he was young. What, what did you dream about your future self, though? Yeah, believe it or not, um, I'm... I wasn't that far off from where I am right now. Oh. Uh, my earliest memory was my father putting me on a table in a tavern at three years old. That's what he tells me. I was three. I learned a song called The Bear Went Over the Mountain. Now, have you ever heard The Bear Went Over the Mountain? No. Can you sing? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to sing you a little bit for sure, it because sure. you'll see it's, it's a good three-year-old song. Uh, <laughs> It goes, the bear went over the mountain, the bear went over the mountain, the bear went over the mountain, and what do you think he saw? He saw another mountain, he saw another mountain, he saw another mountain, and what do you think he did? He climbed that other mountain, he climbed the other mountain, he climbed the other mountain, and what do you think he saw? And it goes on and on mm -hmm. and keeps repeating. So perfect for a three-year-old, but the I remember that the uh, the crowd in that tavern erupted and, and made a sound I wasn't used to, and I got an energy that I... I couldn't explain. Uh -huh. So at three years old, as I had to be pulled off that table, I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay up there. I had, I had more verses to go. I thought, I think this is what I want to be an actor. I want to be a performer. I want to be in front of people and, invite, and, and, and inspire and motivate and in, entertain and inform. And, uh, and so that's really one of my earliest memories. And it was followed by just little moments of acting here and there. My dad didn't want 
to have an actor in the family. Mm -hmm. So when I went to the university, I couldn't be an actor. I studied business, but I took, I did little shows on the side. When I graduated, I was in uh, dinner theaters and performing, but I thought, I don't know if I want the life of an actor, but I want the life of a performer. Uh, so I will slide another story when you're ready, but that began to sort of, the, the universe was kind of lining up for what do we do with somebody who likes to sell, is in business, but wants to perform. Um, and lo and behold, there comes the, the career of a corporate trainer. Wow. Yes, I'm interested to know. You don't want to be an actor, but you want to be a performer. It's how is that leading to the career phenomenon, career in selling and teaching people how to sell? Well, I, I actually think that actors make great salespeople. Um, and I don't mean in an unethical way, by the way. I mean that, in, in, you know, there is learning. I just wrote a book. It was supposed to be called It's Not the Words, It's the Tune. But there's learning what to say and then learning how to say it. And, be, and, and I think one of the things that salespeople struggle with is, is sounding authentic, is sounding real. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing we can do is sit behind them and go, hey, ha, ah, you got, I want you more authentic. Okay. Uh, how's this? How's this? It's very hard to manufacture an authentic sound. Mm. But for an actor who gets into a character, who for an actor who could cry on stage, they're not poking themselves in the eye. They're taking themselves to a moment of sadness and sorrow, and they're feeling that emotion. And that's where the tears come from. Well, I want to feel the emotion of excitement. I want to feel the emotion of understanding. And so as an actor, I think that the two paths intersect. Mm -hmm. So I'm, it's not that I'm trying to be somebody I'm not. I'm just trying to let who's ever listening to me say, not only do I love that product, I love that person. Mm -hmm. And that's where authenticity has, you know, belongs in selling. And that's why I think acting is kind of a nice crossroad. It, it really enhances our ability to sell. Mm -hmm. And then tell us from that side of performance, how did you get into a career in sales permanently? Right. Well, that was easy. The question is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do two of them for you. I'm gonna answer yours and ask me another one, okay? Absolutely. So the answer is, I got I you know, I've graduated as a business manager from the University of Maryland, and I immediately within two weeks I was selling life, health, and disability insurance for the New York Life Insurance Company right here in Washington D.C. And I sold for two years, three months, two hours, and about 17 minutes. Uh, I I mean, I my career was fairly quick. Uh, by the end of my first year, I was number 11 out of 7,800 agents, so it had nothing to do with me not being able to sell. Mm. I just didn't necessarily connect with a product that really needed to be sold to older individuals. I was 21 years old, protecting people's lives. I I'm not saying a 21-year-old doesn't need life insurance, but I am saying a 50-year-old needs it a lot more. A 30-year-old with children or a mortgage or a wife, and none of that, not even my friends. So I couldn't connect to the product. And if you want to, want to, I think one of the biggest dangers in selling is not believing in your product. Mm. It's hard for a 21-year-old to believe in life insurance mm. when you've never lost anyone that's close to you. Uh, but I had... a um, you know, a very unusual moment, if you don't mind me telling the story, where I was in for a Monday morning class and I wasn't in the best of moods. And I was, there were 22 what was called a, uh, apprentice field underwriters, AFUs, waiting for the trainer to come in in the morning. And we were grumbling and moaning because we've got to be in this training and not out selling. And uh, I, the, the phone rang. Any of those 22 people could have picked up that phone. But I was closest. I picked it up. And the training manager said, we're stuck. We got a car parked behind us. We can't get out. Do something, anything. Don't tell them that we're stuck. Just get up there. And so that's the first time where I got up and I said, uh, 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 well, we're going to work on a, on a project together. And the project was a story, a canned sales talk called the Live, Die, Quit story. Remember it like it was yesterday. And that story the theme of the story was, as a life insurance salesman, I can take care of you if you live, die, or quit somewhere along the way. 
And I had learned it as a canned speech. Well, as an actor, I thought, what am I going to do? I'm going to teach these 21 other people how to perform that script that we learned. Wow. And I broke them into sections and I direct them here and there. And about 40 minutes later, the, trails, the, the training manager came in and looked at what was going on because there was a lot of energy in that room. And people were enjoying it. It was like the bear went over the mountain. That crowd was <laughs> resonating. And uh, he just waved at me like, keep going. You just keep going. And I thought to myself, you lost a, you lost a life insurance salesman today because this is what I want. I want to do this. And uh, because, you know, even for an author and sometimes in our careers, it doesn't, we don't find our career. It finds us. Mm -hmm. We just got to have our eyes open. And that moment, that day, that career found me. And not that I became a trainer in the morning, but now I had a goal. Now I, I saw a path. I saw the love of selling and the love of performing coming together. Mm -hmm. And um, that moment at the Washington GO, uh, changed my life. Wow, 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 wow. Rob, I have two, two questions about that. And, you know, let's, let's start with the basic one first. At the age of 21, joining the, the as an agent, right, and then competing with, seven, you know, 7,800 7, people around the country, and then just one year in, you became the, the 11th performer within the whole, you know, like, group of agents. What did you do? so successfully yeah. yeah and this is gonna be tougher for me like i can get into i can break it down as a xerox person hard at new york life because like i said i was walking around with three uh sales scripts memorized in my head so i i only way i can answer it is this it was a little bit of luck no i'm gonna say it again a lot of luck <laughs> and and a very competitive individual so I, I realized I, was, I used to be a, a basketball player. Now, I'm not professional, but I played for my high school and, mm. and I played a lot of league ball and I was a point guard. I loved to compete. I loved, I loved competing. I, wasn't, I didn't enjoy losing a lot, but I could handle it if I knew I did everything possible, everything imaginable to, to try and win that game. Mm. If, if, if a victory didn't follow, I could live with that. I could never live with the fact of being defeated and not trying as hard as I could or, or, or applying the skills that I had learned. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, I, as what was coming together as a salesman for me was a drive and a determination to approach it like a basketball game, do everything possible under the sun to try and make this sale. Don't be outworked. Don't be out hustled. You, you know, that'll never happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then luck came in play. And I actually, the luck part for me was, I was selling some lawyers and, and I'd sold them a health insurance policy. And they called me one day and said, bring a couple applications. We have some clients that are coming in that, that will need life insurance and we're gonna, they're gonna, we're gonna have you sell it to them. Said, okay, so I was kind of, I just order took it. I didn't really sell it. But uh, it was for $3 million of whole life insurance for two 80 year old people. And back in the, uh, I'm dating myself, but back in the early 80s, that was an enormous, those were enormous policies with enormous premiums. And um, that moved me across what we call the pro rata board, the board that was sort of showing my average, et cetera, mm -hmm. shot me across that board and um, I became a star. Now I wanna stay with this for a second longer because this, I think, is the interesting part. Mm. So I had this very lucky, big, massive sale land in my lap. What a genius I am. Not really, just kind of lucky and a guy that was working hard. But they gave me a corner office. They gave me, I was overlooking the Potomac River in the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., a magnificent theater. And I dressed differently and I walked differently. And I believed that I was the greatest salesperson who walked the earth. I maybe not the greatest, but I believe that I was number eleven out of seven eight hundred. So the next year, remember I told you I went to over two years. Hmm. The next year, New York Life looks at you and says, "We started scratch. We'd love for you to be, you know, do all you can do, but you started zero. Well, I made the chairman's council my second year, top two and a half percent of the company. Uh, I wasn't number 11, but I was one of the superstars within the company. Mm. And I didn't have a big sale land in my lap. I just ground it out. 
just fought and dug and believed I was the best thing in the world. And boy, when you believe that, you're dangerous. And so I achieved success in my second year without having a big sail land in my lap because my because in my head I believed that I was as great as everybody thought I was. <laughs> I I was I was reading my own news clipping, so to speak. Anyway, my problem was my third year, I kind of burned out. Mm. That's I don't know if that's slang, but I got weary. I I was so competitive. I wanted to hold on to that corner office. I would sell anything and anyone. Uh and that's unhealthy. That's not good. And so one of the problems that I lived was what happens when we have that much success, maybe a little too early mm. in life, when we're not mature enough to handle it. Mm. And that's one of the issues that that you know was created at New York Life for me and why I got out of the New York Life industry, the insurance industry. Wow, wow. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. And and I really thanks for the authenticity of sharing about the uh, you know, like being success at the very early age and it you know, sometimes it's hard for us to to absorb the success and 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 how to, how to handle it also so it takes time to to be uh, flourish right so and and now go to the moment of the training all right at, at the age of 22 you have the training manager because the the this car was stuck right it was jamming in the band and he could not join and then you create the environment you know an event out of you know just support but then it, the energy was there because you know follow the, the the song you know the bear went over the mountain right and so you make the excitement you make the excitement for everybody and that then you realize that is a, a career that rock wants right and compare between a salesperson you have a lot of income if you can create you know a, a good account versus a trainer then 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 maybe the income is stable but it's not you know off the hook like that so why did you know that moment happen in your head well yeah and i want to compliment you that's a question i've never been asked and it but it should have always been asked it's a great question because i claim that i should be you know have you ever heard of the guinness book of world records yes yes was, okay i claim i should be in the guinness book of world records for the largest pay cut ever taken by a human being okay. <laughs> you nailed it i looked and i thought I was out earning my father, okay, at age 22, uh, you know, and I was still living at home. Uh, the and I, but I looked in the mirror and I thought, I'm, I'm now, you know, I'm, I'm turning 23 at this point when I, when I had that epiphany, that moment, and I thought, is it all about income? Is that why I'm here? Mm -hmm. Was I put on this earth for that reason, or was I put on this earth to make a difference? I, you know, I, I don't I don't know the quote, but I but I know that sometimes we consider the richest human being is the one who who gets up every morning and loves what mm -hmm. he or she does. Um, so income. Yes. But I uh, the decision wasn't that difficult for me because I may have been immature in many ways. This was a, now I look back and go, I was a little more mature than I thought on this one because I thought, no, this is this is the time where if I'm ever going to go for it. I go now and and um, I, I you know I don't need to make all that money I need to find what's fulfilling for me wow. and um, and so yep a massive pay cut and nope I never complained a moment about it because I found something that it's like a fix as they say I you know I was getting an acting fix yeah. I was getting an act you know a, a, that rush and I wasn't getting that as an insurance agent uh, I was getting a lot of income, a lot of pats on the back, uh, but we're all wired differently. Mm. Uh, believe me, I had a lot of people go, are you sure that's what you want to do? Including my father. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, I, and I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. And I always thought if it doesn't work out, I can, I can always go back to the life insurance business. But to run, to, to live a life wondering what would happen if I had tried? Mm. You know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to live that life. So I figured I'll be the I'll be the luckiest man on earth, whether this succeeds or whether it fails, because I won't be stuck and, and held back by my fear of change, my fear of you know failure. Wow. So it was easy. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. So 
if you compare at that age, right, versus a few years earlier with all the success in the sales, how was your life changed between the two? I well, it it, it was um, it was interesting because as, a, as an life insurance agent, I almost always sold at night, and um, as a corporate trainer, um, I always worked during the day. So <laughs> right off the bat, I got that I got to see my friends a little bit more, uh, but I also began to travel. Mm -hmm. Most trainers travel, and um, and so I, I had to learn how to sort of survive on the road. Mm. Uh, it sounds easy, but uh, you know, particularly at Xerox, when I was a trainer for Xerox, I had one year, year my last year where I was out 280 nights of, of the year. Mm. I had three children, three small children. Uh, I had a wife that, that loved me, mm. thank goodness. And yeah. although I was back in the throes of making a nice living, but not necessarily being a great husband or father. So all, all of a sudden, I'm coming up to another crossroads, which is I love what I'm doing, but I think that, but, but I have to stop looking at my wife and saying, there's nothing I can do. There was something I could do. Mm. And that was to leave Xerox, which was a much, much more difficult decision for me because I love Xerox. Mm. I still love Xerox. Mm. I still, we, we call it bleeding blue X's. I still bleed blue X's. Xerox was very good to me and very understanding when I chose to leave and actually hired me as a consultant to continue working with um, uh, their customers in a lot of different areas, uh, which is a great lesson in why you, when you leave, you leave like a, like a, like honorably mm. and you leave with, with dignity and class. Mm. And you don't, even if, the, even if the company maybe wasn't as good to, to you, you never walk out that door angry yeah. uh, because in fact, they contributed to my success as a consultant, wow. you know, and I didn't see that coming. But um, in any case, you know, the, the journey continues. <laughs> and I think that is that's a that's that's a the hard decision that you made, but it's a wonderful decision that you made because as zero, you contribute to the organization and the people within the organization. But on your own, you contribute for many clients who are gonna become a better seller, build better, you know, life for themselves and then bring better products for their clients also. So this is a very wise choice. So I booked on my calendar in April of 2023 to say happy 30 years anniversary for your, for your journey. All right. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about that. I know. And then we're going to get to that a, a little, you know, in a little time in, in the, this conversation. Okay. But I want to examine the time you at zero. Um, you know, a little bit here. We have a lot of trainers, right? And uh, in the works. And of quite a few of them also come in from the background in, you know, like theater arts or, 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 or performance and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from from your world until, you know, the world of training, there's a lot of skill that you need to fine tune along the way, a lot of, you know. So where did you learn those skills at and then and so that you can train a better facilitator, a better trainer? Yeah, I, I'll tell you, you know, there's an old lesson in, in training. If you want to learn something, teach it. Mm. OK. And so I think I was a, a, what we call an unconscious competent. It came fairly naturally to me, but that's not good enough for salespeople either. You know, to be natural at it sounds like the perfect level to be at but when you hit a slump when you hit when you when you're not as effective and our careers oftentimes have peaks and valleys what do you fix when you don't know what it is you're doing right what Xerox did was because they knew who my desire to be a trainer mm. was they put me on uh, you know, after I sold for them they allowed me to to be a trainer and I had some natural skills certainly I call them the great equalizers uh, uh, energy and enthusiasm mm. you know uh, in the world of training and in the world of most of what much of what we do mm. that we can make mistakes we nobody's perfect we could forget this and drop that and accidentally do this and miss this people will forgive you mm. but what they won't forgive is a lack of energy and enthusiasm oh. and it's 100 percent within our control 
So I had this energy and enthusiasm, which in a sense was probably masking the, my my um, inability to understand how to be a trader so well. And yet I was a sponge. I loved learning. And within a very short period of time, I was teaching the train the trainer program for Xerox. I was training other trainers. And by doing that class after class, year after year, mm. I became uh, just very comfortable studying not what I would you know, study, what I was trying to do and what other great trainers were doing and trying to process that, put it in a process. And when I got successful at it, and I did, and actually it's the first book I ever wrote was on training. Uh, it, it, the world, I, I was doing 20, 25 sessions a year. These were one week classes mm. for Xerox uh, with a six, seven month waiting list to get in. This was a program that had averaged one to two deliveries a year. And all of a sudden, everyone in the country wanted to come take this class because I was mixing in what I knew of training and what I knew of selling. Uh -huh. Most people, most trainers go, well, we're, we're not selling, we're training. Oh, yeah. you better think twice. <laughs> we're selling the information that we've got. We're trying to get that that audience to say, I want to hear this real badly. Mm -hmm. Because if we have an audience like that, training becomes a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And in the real world, that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. So I began to study processes of merging what I knew about selling to what I was learning about training. And then I had my acting kind of sitting over top of it. Mm -hmm. It was like three three worlds coming together. Wow. And, you know, and it became, but but that's sort of how I did it at Xerox. I became good at it because I got forced in front of that room to survive five days of talking about training and observing training. And maybe not my first class, uh, but by the time I got some rhythm going, I, I understood how to do it. Wow, wow. And you mentioned about the, the, the great equalizer, right? And I, and I want to say thank you for sharing that because, like you say, the uh, the energy and the enthusiasm are the two things that we can always control and decide on it, right? And a lot of people forgot about it, forgot about it, yeah. and they let life carry them and stuff. So over the years, Rob, how, how did you remind yourself of that ability to control so can, you can always give the... the, the energy and the enthusiasm disregard how things happen in the background in your life and world and stuff and give the best to the people yeah i uh, love that question uh, i you know i don't have it on right now because i'm not conducting a seminar mm. but if you ever see any picture of me over the last 30 years or longer actually probably 40 years you look carefully and you'll see the little shiny element either on my suit jacket or on my shirt. And it's a little lightning bolt. Ah. And I, as many years as I've done this, as many audiences I've spoken in front of, tens of thousands. I still get up in the morning when I've got a program to deliver and I pin that, that lightning bolt on. Ah. And that lightning bolt is my reminder of never take anything for granted. Wow. You know, doesn't matter. Nobody cares what you did yesterday or the day before. It all matters now. It's today. It's this moment. And so uh, that is a visual reminder. If you and I ever meet, I'm going to give you a lightning bolt and put it in your hand. And I'm going to ask you, don't ever put it on unless you're in front of an audience so that you never forget energy and enthusiasm. And how could I could I tell you one just fast story about, about this? Jeez. That just for people who are listening who are trainers in particular. The world of training... Um, oftentimes comes with, um, you, you heard me say, boy, you should have seen my 10th time I taught it. Well, what about the first time or the second time? Often in this world, we're given curriculum the day before. You know, in, in other words, we don't know our material as well as we want to. I'm going to give you a, a proof source of how important energy and enthusiasm is. Uh, when I first worked for Xerox, before I even taught a trainer trainer, I was my first task was to teach a a two-week class in sales with that they were still writing and the developers were slow and late and when we finally had this audiences come in uh, we were getting curriculum the night before for the next day mm. 
And so here I am. I don't really know. I barely know what I'm talking about. I, it, it, it was so unfair. Well, unfair is part of this world. <laughs> and yet what I lacked in knowledge, I made up in, in enthusiasm. When somebody said, asked me a question, I didn't turn my head. I practically ran over to where they were sitting. When they wanted something, I ran and got it for them. When they asked a question, I, I expressed my gratitude. I was so attentive and empathetic to that audience that at the end of those two weeks, they gave me something. I never, by the way, never, ever, ever mentioned, this is my first time. We don't have curriculum. No Trainers who are listening don't ever say that to an audience. Uh, it, it won't go well for you if you do. Uh, so they never knew any of that. At the end, they gave me a Mont Blanc pen, a beautiful black pen, um, which I'm showing you right now. Okay, it still sits right here at my desk. I tell you this story because in my eight more years at Xerox, as I got smarter and smarter, no class ever gave me a pen again. It's not that I wasn't doing a great job. It's that that class was that moved by my effort. And so what I'm reminding people is that what we may lack in information, we tend to make up an effort. If you trust what we're saying, what I'm saying to you and focus on your energy and, in, and, and enthusiasm, and let's throw effort in there too. Audiences will love you. And, wow. and yes, you'll get smarter. I almost worry sometimes that we get too smart because we lose that ability to connect that energy because we're so smart. I don't ever want to be that smart. Mm. I want to be humble. So you carry that pen ever since. Wow, <laughs> beautiful. You have a very beautiful ways to uh, to put yourself as a reminder, a reminder for enthusiasm and 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 energy. If I put the light uh, the, the the lighting bolt on on your on your suit, right? And and yep. and carry the pen to remind you that uh, you know the you know you know like it on the learning process and appreciations of you know your 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 audience, right? How did you give you that, you know, like that lesson so that you have something carry with you every time you perform, you train the people, and as a reminder, where did you learn that? How did I, yeah, how did I learn it? Um, you know, you haven't heard me answer the question this way, but, um, you know, first of all, in terms, terms of being enthusiastic, <laughs> I was kind of born that way. You know, I, 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 I'm not the tallest guy in the world. I don't have hair on my head. I didn't get everything I wanted, apparently. Remember, I wanted to be a basketball player. Mm. Uh, if I stand up nice and straight, I can be five foot ten inches. And if I'm not, tell me I am. Uh, I'll be happy if you do. But um, again, we make it up in effort. I don't know. It's it's for me. Um, I I connected to the lightning bolt actually when I first stepped away from New York life. I. Um, I, right before Xerox, it's the only other company I worked for, I used to go around the country teaching for the National Flood Insurance Program. I would teach these terribly boring classes on <laughs> how to write life insurance, how to underwrite it. But ha, huh? I, I had a girlfriend at that time who became my wife who made me a scroll. Uh, I can, it's about 10 feet by me. I could show it to you if you want. Yeah. And it i nicknamed myself the thriller and it had lightning bolts on it and i would go into audiences and i'd say we're gonna have a great session if my name isn't rob the thriller jollis and this was for the, for anybody who ever remembers michael jackson michael jackson had an album called the thriller well today in our conversation hi you have the distinct privilege of meeting the original thriller because i had my scroll and I had my nickname two years before that album. Uh, now, you want to see the scroll? <laughs> yes, of course. Of Show course. it to yeah, you. Yeah, of course, please. Stay with me. This, <laughs> also keep in, the, in, my, in, my, uh, in my room. <laughs> and, it, and I would Rob the Thriller Jollis, okay? <laughs> and we had 15, 16 trainers, and I, I got in trouble for it because um, – all the insurance companies that wanted a trainer, they, they talked to each other at meetings and things. And so the company I worked for called me in because they said, we keep getting calls 
for people, for companies that want to be trained, but they'll only be trained by the thriller. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rob, what's your wife's name? Ronnie. Ronnie. R O N N I. Ronnie. She's uh, an artist. R O N N I. N N Y. R O N N I. And, um, Yeah, and she's a wonderful. She was, you know, you talk another journey. She was an art teacher uh, for 20 years, and when I left and became an entrepreneur, I said, "Not now, hang tight. Let me get things settled here. Make sure I know what I'm doing." And then I invited her out. She's been a professional artist on her own for about 20 years. Wow, wow, Rob. Have you ever asked Ronnie what does he do that Rob does the, the thriller things for you? Did you ask her why did she do that for you? Did I ask her why? Yeah. I didn't ask her why. I, got, I pleaded for her to do it. I didn't <laughs> ask her why to do it. I said, I'm begging you to do it. And actually, um, through the years, she's created different things for me. It's a, it's a wonderful marriage because I, am, I can see things in my brain very creatively and artistically. And maybe that's translating and coming across in this conversation that we're having. But I can't really draw a straight line. <laughs> Just I don't have that ability. But I can see it, mm. and so I married a woman that um, can draw a straight line. Yeah. Uh, she she's very good. Uh, she teaches her art form. She's in galleries and things. She does nicely. Uh, but uh, so that's not the only thing she's created for me. <laughs> uh, but that one I always I've always loved because uh, particularly the fact that. Uh, companies will call it for me and expecting that the thriller would be teaching these flood seminars, which were the, ironically the most boring seminar you could ever teach. It is the wonders of flood insurance. Trust me, it's rough. Actually, real fast, but I, I'm very half full, if you know what that means. I see things in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. And so I always saw that as a blessing in a sense, because when I learned to become a trainer there, uh, I felt like I was walking around with the worst subject possible. Mm. So when I came, went to Xerox, and when I got myself in the training center, and was and learning the Xerox way, I was teaching things that were fascinating. Mm. I had come from so when you can teach something that's boring and uninteresting, the world's your oyster because anything else is going to be easy. Yeah, you think about it. <laughs> well, I. Uh... Thanks for uh, sharing. Yeah. I want to bring you to the to the winter of 1993, okay? Because that is yes. a very emotional moment in your life. You've been very, very successful of, at Xerox, right? And inside of you, you also have another dream of want to do something different on your own. So I think that period is very emotional and very a lot of thought happened to your head. So tell us. How did how that transition happen inside of you so that you decided to walk on your own shoe at, in April that year? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I um, it's been a you know I, I'm a I'm a person that wants to keep climbing, mm. and I felt like I had climbed high enough. And at Xerox, like many wonderful corporations, but when you work for a corporation, you can be a star performer. Um, I was sent out on the road because I was good at what I was doing, but I wasn't necessarily compensated anymore for it. Mm. I was just doing what the company hired me to do. Mm. And uh, I felt that I was beginning to miss years with my children that I could never get back. Mm. And so, whereas I, you know, that, that common answer being, there's nothing I can do about all this travel, I realized, well, there is one thing. You could step out on that high wire, and and see if you can balance and get across that line. Mm -hmm. And so it was really done um, for that reason. Uh, I was still, be quite honest with you, um, very anxious, mm -hmm. very very. I don't like the word nervous, but but anxious. And um, but what gave me peace and calm and made me very calm was thinking. That in a sense I have this itch, and I want to scratch this itch. Mm. And it, we're coming back to another theme, right? If I don't do this now, will I think to myself, "What if? Mm. What if?" And so I thought, "Let's go take a walk on that wire. Mm. And if I fail, 
I'll never have that itch again. I don't worry about scratching any itches. Uh, I'll be I'll be content where I am. And so um, I felt ready to go. And quite frankly, I wasn't gone from Xerox for a month, maybe two, where I didn't wasn't walking around with the biggest smile on my face saying, this is the greatest move I've ever made. And like, like I said, I worked for me longer than all other jobs I ever had combined and then some. Um, uh, some of us are just bred to be entrepreneurs and some of us aren't. Uh, but I clearly learned as a, as that this was for me. I loved being having ideas mm -hmm. and being able to try them with a corporation. And it's nothing against a corporation. You work for a big company like Xerox. Ideas are wonderful. Mm -hmm. They have processes. They have behaviors. You don't walk in and go, hey, I got a better idea. <laughs> Let's try this. Uh, drives the corporation crazy. So uh, I really thought, you know what? I want to I want to gamble on my ideas. Mm -hmm. I want to see if they were. I want to gamble on me. And I did. And um, it's I'm fiercely proud of of hanging in there, of hanging in during a pandemic of hanging in and just continuing to evolve and, and reinvent. Mm. And uh, um, I just think that's what makes life exciting. Wow, Rob. Let's travel all the way back when you were at New York, uh, New, New York Life Insurance, okay? You got a big paycheck, but then you moved on to, you moved on to being a trainer back then. And then a lot of people question you, you know, on that move, right? And then now into even including your father, like you say earlier, now you move, you know, at, as, uh, at zero and then you move on to being solo. What did the people tell you about scratching your itch? Oh, I had two fathers, my father-in-law and my father, uh -huh. not real happy because in a sense, I had landed at a, a dream job. Xerox, particularly when I was working there in the 80s was this amazing company mm. the training center that i was at which i've described to you somewhat but uh, there were 300 head of deer on this 2400 acres i would park my car and walk around the deer to go into <laughs> go into this facility that had an athletic facility a dining hall entertainment it was a village in there oh. uh, two and a half million square feet of office space Okay, in this house you know, around this magnificent acreage. And for me to say, yeah, guess what, dads? I'm leaving. Uh, and, and, oh, you are? You have three young children? Yeah, where, where are you going? I got this idea. I'm going to work for me. Uh, I, I'm a dad too. I think I would have fainted. And yet, um, particularly my dad, who, you know, he knew that, well, I got a boy here that isn't going to be outworked. He's isn't going to be out hustled. Um, he's going to be given it his all. And when I told them, please understand that I'm going to I'm going to scratch this itch, and if it doesn't work, I'll be a good corporate worker for the rest of my life. You know, and I'll take good. I mean, my father-in-law, I'll take good care of your daughter, sir. To my dad, I'll take good care of my wife and my children. But but I got to do this now. And both of them said, okay, all right. Wonderful. And then, like I said, within, well, within six months, I had doubled my income at Xerox. Wow. For, and, and, uh, and then no one was saying anything anymore. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's funny how, particularly in the old school with fathers and father-in-laws, uh, if, you know, if your dream is generating income, you'll find that they're a little bit more tolerant of your wacky <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Well, and how did Ronnie say back then, you know? What's that? How did Ronnie uh, say at that moment, though? Ronnie was on board. Ron, you know, uh -huh. your, your spouse knows you. Uh -huh. um, and um, and so Ronnie was, uh, um, uh, Ronnie, Ronnie was not a person who's going to bet against me. <laughs> um, you know, I love when people bet against me. It makes me even hungrier. Um, <laughs> So when I hear somebody questioning what I'm doing, it's okay. You don't have to feel badly. You don't know it, but you're actually feeding my desire to work even harder. Mm -hmm. um, so, but Ronnie, you know, at that point we had been married uh, probably eight years, dated for, well, probably knew each other for 10 years. Mm -hmm. 
she knew me. Mm. And um, and and I you know I know it probably sounds a little bit arrogant. I don't mean to. I clearly recognized that I could fail. Mm. I just didn't want that to be the reason why I wouldn't try. Um, so what you know, I have a son, for example, who's an actor. He's a comedian, professional comedian. Mm. Um, I had struggled with that decision. I mean, not the decision was his, but struggle with how I felt about that. Mm. And yet, and he knew it. I, 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 do, I, I will not tell you that I just magically went, wow, well, yay. Uh, but I looked at him and I said, just promise me one thing, that you'll try as hard as you can, but that there will be a time where there's a fork in the road. And if it's not happening, mm. let it go. That's the problem when people have a dream and they don't know how to let the dream go because mm. nobody wants to be a quitter. So that's where you hope that your loved ones will step in. Sort of like if you ever watch boxing, you know, I'm not sure I really want a boxer to go back to the corner, pick up a towel, and throw it into the, into the ring. You know who throws the towel in? The, the corner people, the trainer, the manager who love that trainer, mm. who don't want to see that trainer hurt anymore. That's who picks up the towel, not the boxer. The boxer boxes. Mm. So I felt that I had it. My, my wife was my trainer, or is my manager, <laughs> my, my cut man, okay, my cut woman. I had confidence that she would know how to talk to me. And I had confidence that I would know how to talk to my son. Yeah. And so knowing that, I and being trained as an entrepreneur, I felt more comfortable. And 10 years later, doing a bang up job, I'm very proud. He's, you know, in a very scary career. And yet, he, uh, he, he, he's up on stage five to six nights a, a week wow. performing comedy. See, yeah. Well, you know, the trust is very important to make sure that the people can, you know, if we give them the trust and the support that needed, they can always, you know, like thrive, right? And then yeah. you're only doing a very wonderful job throughout your life, not only to trust and support you, but draw straight lines for you. <laughs> That's well said well said i've never actually put it that way but that could be a, a little book or a blog in itself you know, <laughs> my wife would draw straight lines for me <laughs> hey rob um i uh, i want to say congratulations to you for a very successful career the very wise to uh, decision that you make that then despise and um, you know all the emotion that you had um you know but you decided to scratch your itch and and give it a try and and i really admire the the mentality of go all in because a lot of people now you know only go halfway in or even not a third of the way in 20 percent in right so uh and another thing that i want to congratulate you was writing that six books and five of them make uh best selling right because uh, i have a lot of executive friends around the world and by the time they retire, there's two things that commonly they share to me about their regrets. First, they could have always started the company when they was younger or earlier. They make millions for you know for corporation. They even make billions for corporation, but then they didn't you know start their own right. company, right? Second uh, was they always wanted to write their own book and and sharing stories, experience, and let their legacy you know like carry after they pass and uh, but they they haven't done it yet so we we always told tell them that hey john hey mary you know do it it's never late you know you always can do it so rob why did you decide to write your first books so that leading to that many books after that yeah um well believe it or not uh, the idea came from a train tra one of my train and trainer sessions mm -hmm. i teach them how to sell that material to me and I don't, and I don't just say do it. I mean, I have something called the U Pop, where it's a seven-step acronym, and it's very detailed of the model they're following to sell an idea. Mm. And uh, but I don't want them doing something that is Xerox. Do something that you have passion for, so that the information. I, when you're teaching somebody to train, even teaching them to sell, sometimes the best way to do it is, I'm going to teach you to sell, but don't sell your product right now. You're gonna, that's going to confuse you. Mm. Your product, that's the easy part. We're going to, so we bring it to something else. I always had people in those programs talk about water skiing. If you like to water ski, talk about whatever, you know, something you like to collect things. Tell me about your collection. But this person had written a book 
and he went through and he was like this and here's what's in it for you if you do it and he and here's the source that i used to help make that happen and i sat there like with my eyes wide open i went oh, i'm like so many other people i want to write a book and in a sense he gave me a i mean he gave me an author who wrote a book called how to write a book author's name is robert mager it's an older book but it's probably still out there and i bought that book uh, and I followed that book and um, I did it. Uh, and and I, I will tell you that it's such a joy to, to write and to have that success there that I've committed my life to helping other, other people who dream of writing books. Oh, I right. mentor an enormous number of authors um, and, uh, because I think there is a system and there is a process. And I think that when you, it doesn't have to be a book, huh? When you have something that's brought you joy, and that joy came from hard work and some luck, mm. because finding a publisher, you, you know, is not the easiest thing in the world. Then one of the, I think, to keep the universe straight, you have a responsibility mm. <laughs> uh, to not turn your back on another individual who said, "Gee, that's my dream, but I don't know how to do it." Well, hey, good luck with that, Charlie. No. Well, um, I'll extend my hand. Wow. And so um, the happiest moments for me are when a book hits the market, but the second happiest books are when my mentors, when the people that I've had a hand in and got them straight and got them across the finish line, when their book hits the market. Mm. That's exciting for me. Wow. But Rob, where did you find time for all of this? You've been having a full-time job, you know, even more than a full-time job because your own company, you don't have time to rest, right? And have family yeah. free, your wife, and, you know, responsibilities for many, many other things. And still squeeze the time for right? Easy answer. Easy answer, huh? Yeah. The answer is, I'm in the airports and in the airplanes a great deal of my life, particularly back when I was writing my, you know, those books. So I, I, I know I had a couple books where, where I took pride in telling people I may have written five pages actually in my house. Mm. See, when I'm on the road, I'm away from my family. Now I, I can control some of it, but I still am on the road. Mm. Uh, so when I'm home, I don't want to be in a closet somewhere writing a book, but here I am in the airport mm. and I'm following it out. I write outlines. Here I am following my outline. Now I'm up in the air for two, three hours. Now I'm in a hotel room, mm. you know, with, with by myself. Uh, now I'm back up in the airport. Now I'm back up in the air. So um, I took pride in the fact that I wrote uh, almost every word in just about every book, not at home, not, not taking myself away from my family, but in the air. Now, that doesn't work for everybody. So when I mentor an author, what we do is, we just look to where we can carve out time. For instance, let me ask you a question. Oh. Uh, you look to be in pretty good shape, pretty good condition. Do you exercise? I do. Uh huh. How important is that to you? Very important, yes. Okay. And so when life gets in the way, I already know you've got at least one kid, okay? When life gets in the way and you, and you miss your exercise, I'm, I'm guessing you find a way of trying to say, okay, I'm going to move this, change that, but I'm going to get that, that routine in mm -hmm. because it's important to you. With writers, what we do is, is if we don't have somebody who flies a lot, we say, let's treat this like we're working out. Mm -hmm. Let's make, even if it's three hours a week, you know, let's make it that precious. And let's not use the excuse of, well, life got in the way. Well, got in the way on your workouts too, but you got your three workouts. <laughs> so we're going to, you know, and so a lot of it is some, some figuring out what is an intelligent time schedule. Mm -hmm. And I say intelligent because people say, I'm going to write 20 pages a week. No, you'll probably fail at that. But I'll bet you could write five pages a week, particularly if we have an outline and we protected some time. Mm -hmm. I had one individual who actually set his clock earlier <laughs> so instead of getting up at six in the morning he was getting up at five uh, but he, but we knew one thing he had an hour five days a week that he didn't know he had yeah okay wow. and that was for writing not answering emails not to not, not a quick look at the paper not, that was one hour of writing and it's not like he sat there and thought what am i gonna write about coming down an outline so but anyway that's how we do it beautiful thanks rob I have two last questions for you today because I think we run out of time. Uh, 
And the first question is about thinking. So I really admire your thinking because uh, your whole life there's a lot of moment of thinking, a lot of thinking to and uh, you know process to to be in the competition and then to get better to grow. Right? My wife and I we've been we've been trying to uh, seek answers from experts like you are, uh, you know, so that we can share those for people to improve their ability to think because we believe that the ability to think these days are decreasing, is not increasing, right? So, yes. Rob, how have you been helping you to expand your ability to think over the years? Wow, that's an interesting question. I think, remember what I told you about half full, about how I see things in a positive manner? Mm. I think that um, I probably, if I went to school now, mm. I would probably be diagnosed as uh, maybe um, att having attention deficit. And um, but, but when I went to school, people just said, read it again and, and, and pay attention. <laughs> uh, but I had to learn how to... Um, read things three times. I had to learn how to shut out all the ex exterior noises and, and sounds. Um, and so I've conditioned my mind to um, be very focused because I can't succeed like I think I'm a normal person if there's something called normal there. Uh, and so I consider it a blessing because I had to work that much harder to be able to read and comprehend to be able to study, uh, that um, I'm conditioned that way. To this day, when my wife comes in and I'm writing something, and she starts talking, my hand goes up. That means I can't, I can't hear you and be and do this and get back to where I am. Mm. I must stay here, and so and she knows that. I, I, I promise, I'm fun to be around. Mm. <laughs> but but um, I think what could be defined as a deficit, as a difficulty, in a sense became an asset mm. for me because um, I, it's the only way I could succeed in school. Um, so you have to do it a lot more than others, you know, pay attention. I have to be, yeah, I have to be very disciplined about my approach mm. to writing, to thinking. There's the word that, that I'm looking for, I suppose. The word is discipline. Discipline. You know, people see that as, you know, was well, that military? No, not that level. Mm. But if I say I'm going to do five pages in a week, I bet I do five pages in a week. Mm. You know, uh, that takes a level of discipline because life gets in the way too. What about a vacation? What about, a, you know, you're not going to be writing then. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll just figure out where, like that workout we talked about, where. So because I have a, a very disciplined approach, due to the fact that I couldn't be successful without it. Mm. Uh, I look at other people that try and fail and I think, wow, they, they, you know, intellectually, I think they're probably smarter than I am, mm. but they lack the discipline yeah. that I was brought up that I had to use to survive. Wow. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Then the disciplinary, uh, the discipline is one of the, uh, the, you know, the, the trade is very, very important for anyone to be successful in what I want to do, not just in the sales, right? So go yes. to the last question, Rob. You are so generous of, uh, for us today with spending your time. We know that uh, at the three years old, your father, you know, uh, you know, was the one that ignited your dream to perform an act, right? And by the time that you went to university, you went to the business world, but now, you know, at the same time, you, you know, you performed on the side and then you got into a career of sales and got the, you know, the, 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 the calling to become a trainer. Then you became a very, very good trainer. Then having your own company, traveling the world, training people, got married to Ronnie and three children, beautiful children, a beautiful journey. Now we want to. Oh, I forgot to mention writing, a, a, you know, all the amazing books and have the people to read if they don't have the chance to, you know, get to know you or interact with you or get the training from you, right? So uh, now moving forward a little bit into the future, is there anything Rob is doing, about to be doing that you, are, you can share with us so we can celebrate with you in advance? Well, 
uh, you know, I, I'm a little behind you, but I'll tell you one thing that I discovered during the pandemic, which is podcasting. I've been a guest on many, many, many podcasts, but I started my own called Pocket Size Pep Talks. I'll I'll get to my 200th by the end of the year. Wow. I want to be as skilled as you are, but I'm working at it. And I will tell you that I, I've been blogging for 13 years. That to me, as a writer, is a way of almost like exercising my writing. But when I blog, and I, I, I blog every other week for 13 years, I never oh. discipline. I never miss a blog date. But I so enjoy the podcast because when I blog, I'm blogging alone. I'm just sitting in a room. I could be sitting in the dark. But when I do what you were doing right here, I get to meet individuals that are interesting like you. I get to learn. And um, so I, I, I would say that's one thing as I, you know, when I retire, I will maintain the podcast. Um, and so that's something I really enjoy doing. Uh, what else? Uh, believe it or not, uh, not that everybody has to do it, but um, I, I've never had time for the game of golf. Never had time. When business was good, I didn't have time. And when business was a little slow, why would I be out playing golf? Yeah. So, so I could never figure out, how do you get good at this game? You know, you have to play it a lot. Who has time to play this thing? But I have a, a buddy of mine that I've known since 10 years old who said, let's go get this thing. And so cool. I've just been playing a little bit more and podcasting and uh uh, I am going to, I have, uh, my 2023 has, um, I've got more dates on the calendar than I can remember in 10 years. I mean, it's really crowded. So I got a lot of work on the road ahead of me, but, um, at some point I'll, I'll slow it down and, but I won't slow that podcast down. I enjoy, I enjoy what we're doing right now. Wonderful. 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 Because the podcast is the way that you also share it lively, live talks to to people around the world, right? And then uh, it's yep. beautiful. And I, I'm happy that you find it interesting and happy doing that. It, and uh, since you're going to travel the world uh, a lot uh, in 2023, there's a lot of time for you at the airport, at the hotel, <laughs> write your seventh book, all right? <laughs> Another one? Well, you know, you got to have a patent. Remember, for anybody who's thinking of writing a book, and they go, you know, they've always had a dream, I go, What's your book about? They go, I don't know that. Remember we said a career finds you, a book finds you. Yeah. I, I'm proud to say that uh, you know I don't just write for writing. Uh, something moves me. Something happens and I go, got it. Yep. And then I begin to outline. I think I got it, mm. um, but I'm struggling with my outline right now. But I've got, I've got something in my head, and you're absolutely right, huh? With this road work coming up, and I haven't been on the road much in the last two and a half years, uh, I should have an outline ready to roll, so uh, maybe the next time you and I talk, I'll tell you about the, the new one that came out. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. I, th I, Rob, thanks a lot for spending your your afternoon joining our show and be so generous in sharing your wonderful journey and advice and everything to to um, our audience. And uh, I, I, I will learn a lot from the, the talk today about the discipline, about you know like go all in and about the energies and enthusiasm all of that are so important and i i hope that the listeners out there if they listen to this they can reflect on what they've been doing and 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 make the change in the course so that you know like they can head in towards something better i uh, yeah. i uh, i want to Uh, I want to congratulate you again for the amazing things that achievements that you've been uh, having and then I wish that you're going to have a lot of more support a lot of more resources than and so that you can be uh, you know achieving more and having a fulfilling life enjoy golf with your friend you know friend time, friendship you. time is Thank also good so don't don't no don't, don't let busy time to let you off course for the golfing with your friend all right <laughs> Thank you for that reminder. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, Rob. Bye bye for now. And I look forward to seeing you one day, either in Vietnam or I'm traveling to the US next year. I hope that I can swing by and say hello to you. You get to Washington, D.C., I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Yeah, I'll buy you beers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple beers too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my friend. Have a wonderful evening. Say hello to Ronnie and your children for me. All right. Well, yeah. Okay, you bet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.